just to confirm, you're just seeing just the presentation. You're not seeing the behind the scenes view, right? That's right. Great. <laughs> okay, so um, environmental, social, and governance investing, a deep dive. So this week happens to be quite the week to talk about ESG investing. The IPCC published an utterly breathtaking report on the state of Earth's climate that makes it clear that climate change is happening. And while there's still time to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, some risks such as rising sea levels are, according to their report, inevitable and irreversible. Also incidentally, BlackRock's iShares chose this week to publish a new white paper on ESG investing, which is also very stark in its language. And I'll start the presentation with the opening paragraph from that paper. It reads as follows. The idea that climate risk represents investment risk has moved from a novelty in the investment world to something approaching mainstream thinking in just a few years. This shift has recently accelerated as a result of four powerful reinforce, uh, reinforcing moves. First, record damages from extreme weather events in 2020 have underscored the importance of pricing in physical risk. Second, regulation globally has shifted decisively towards a net zero economy. Third, clean energy innovations are reducing the cost uh, and carbon intensity of energy production. And finally, investor sentiment appears to be turning in favor of sustainable strategies. This paragraph highlights the key points of why ESG investing is becoming mainstream and why BlackRock and others in the finance world are increasingly believing in ESG as a viable strategy. The risks of climate-related losses are large to the point that even the most cynical of investment firm has to develop a climate strategy to ensure the safety of their investments. Insurance firms have to price in additional risk factors for assets in high-risk areas, and even the heads of central banks, such as Mark Carney, a governor of the Bank of England, said in a 2019 interview that 75% of his conversations with the heads of banks are about climate-related concerns, specifically how to price in climate-related risks when they make loans to businesses and to individuals. Now, through all of this, there is an ESG investing industry which is undergoing extremely rapid evolution as it attempts to reliably use environmental, social, and governmental data to direct investments towards companies that will not only perform well now, but will either help to create the net zero carbon future or will flourish in a net zero carbon future. However, there are a variety of challenges facing the ESG industry and to ESG investing as a whole, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, a few quick disclaimers. Um, ESG investing has its backgrounds in you know, sort of ethical investing and that sort of thing. I'm not really here to push any sort of ethical message. I'm here to uh, discuss about some of the information I found in my research, and this isn't a sort of holier-than-thou thing. So I'm really trying to stick to the facts as I've found. So uh, with that, any questions before getting in any further into uh, presentation? I don't think so. Great. So how big is ESG investing? Well, as the slide shows, ESG investing has been accelerating over the past few years and, ex and is expected to keep accelerating. Now, this is due to a combination of factors, including some recent strong performance of ESG funds. And this comes from things such as the recent boom in electric cars, stay at home stocks, cloud computing and other disruptive technologies. And also comes from ongoing challenges facing older industries such as renewable energy becoming cheaper than oil or gas in recent years. And other challenges exist such as um, governments planning on phasing out the sale of internal combustion engines and cars over the next 15 years as is the case in California and in the European Union. And lastly, there's also just a general preference um, among investors these days towards ESG investing as a whole. But it should be noted that while ESG is the current label for responsible investing, quote unquote, socially conscious investing is not a new idea. And many people engage with some form of socially conscious investing. Approximately one third of all professionally managed money is in some form of sustainable investment product, be it under the, uh, the ESG label or something else. Now, with that much capital already having been invested in sustainable strategy, and with the rate of sustainable investment expected to increase, there is a legitimate push towards firms having to take ESG investing seriously for fear that they're going to miss out on pretty substantial amounts of capital if they do not. Pause there for any questions just on the outset. 
Okay. Um, so what separates ESG from other forms of, you know, quote unquote, responsible investing? Well, the definitions of impact investing, socially responsible investing, ethical investing, and ESG, they're not strict. In fact, quite the, quite the opposite. It's actually very common to see these terms being used very, very loosely and interchangeably as kind of like uh, buzzwords in the industry. Uh, each investment firm, news outlet, etc., can use these terms differently. And so there's some confusion on what really means what. Now, um, I'm going to be paraphrasing some definitions from Investopedia, and they do try to offer some clarity on you know, what each of these terms really means. But from my own experience, having researched this, is that uh, each source kind of uses these terms a little differently. So Investopedia's definitions are nice, but they're not consistently used. So to start off with uh, impact investing, uh, impact investing is apparently an umbrella term that can encompass any, any investment activity where you're trying to balance financial return with a social change of some kind. So this is apparently inclusive of the other forms of responsible investing, ESG, socially responsible investing, ethical investing, et cetera, fits under the umbrella of impact investing, at least according to Investopedia. Socially responsible investing, or SRI, is often used synonymously with ESG out in uh, the wild, so to speak. But Investopedia tries to claim that there is a difference by saying that ES, uh, the SRI uses the same data that ESG funds use, but also utilizes an ethical screening uh, methodology based upon either religious, personal, or political beliefs. But again, the exact definitions vary. I've seen some investment firms using SRI in completely as a synonym to ESG. Ethical investing is a bit more consistent in its terminology, and this usually refers to investment strategies based upon religious beliefs or personal political beliefs. Uh, but in general, these typically focus on excluding the quote unquote sin industry, such as alcohol, weapons, gambling, et cetera. And while these funds may not necessarily prioritize you know, ecological uh, sustainability, some of them end up having similar portfolios to an ESG fund kind of by incident. But in general, we're not going to be spending too much time on these particular funds today, but they are out there. So lastly, that leads us to ESG investing. So where ESG attempts to differentiate itself is that it attempts to be a data-driven approach to balancing financial return with uh, social and environmental outcomes. So ESG investing utilizes non-financial data, specifically on a firm's environmental impacts, social impacts, workplace practices, decision-making and governance structures, and other factors as well, in order to help explain and decide upon traditional financial data. ESG investing is very diverse with no set definitions of what data to use, what screening criteria to apply, or what investment strategy to utilize. Uh, these can vary from fund to fund, and they do vary from fund to fund. While most ESG funds use ecological and social screening criteria to determine whether or to invest in a firm or not, some ESG funds take a different approach and do invest in low ESG companies with the idea of using the fund's ownership votes to force the company towards sustainability. Some actively managed ESG funds also use some very exotic and non-traditional strategies as well, and these usually have nothing to do with sustainability, but they're uh, interesting to say the very least, but you have to kind of go into the um, usually have to go to um, hedge funds to find some of these really exotic types of strategies, but it's another topic for another day. Again, and just a pause real quick and any questions on anything presented so far. Uh, if there's any questions, I think with a group this size, you can just unmute or if you would wish, you could just raise your hand. Any questions? Uh, Kevin, yeah. I'll, I'll just say it, it's at this point, I don't know if everyone else feels this way, but it's just nice to take in what you're saying. So I'm just, that's where I'm at at this point. Glad <laughs> to hear. <laughs> but, you know, again, um, some of the facts I'll be presenting, they provoke a thought and you want to share it. Um, you know, we're all here for that. Uh, so moving on, defining what ESG data is. Um, so at their core, ESG funds are very similar to your traditional mutual fund. They perform all the traditional financial analysis that you'd expect from a fund in order to maximize profit. However, they add an additional layer of scrutiny based upon social, uh, environmental, social, and governance criteria to help make investment decisions. 
But specifically, what are the kinds of things that they're looking at? Well, under the environmental category, these usually include measures that uh, measure a firm, uh, things like a firm's energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, whether the firm has no waste or very low waste, good treatment of animals, natural resource conservation, using clean energy technologies in the business, et cetera. But it can also include whether the firm has assets that are at risk of loss due to extreme weather or environmental regulatory risk where certain assets may be basically banned for use by government uh, regulation. And this actually is a really large threat that we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation. On the social side of things, um, these measures generally focus on um, the firm's social impact. And this could include such things as fair hiring practices, good treatment of workers, contributing to local economies, data privacy, which is a pretty significant uh, data point, uh, being serious about their products liability, the health and safety of their workers and customers, and using supply chains that also back the same ethics as the parent company so that the products are not made with child labor or something distasteful like that. Now on the governance side of things, we do have, um, this usually refers to whether the corporation has transparent and honest corporate practices and structures, such as using fair and transparent accounting methods in their shareholder reports, consulting with key stakeholder groups on business decisions, allowing shareholders to vote on key decisions, not having conflicts of interest with the choice of board members and not engaging in illegal, illegal activities. So in simple terms, an ESG mutual fund uh, analyzes these categories of data to develop a quote unquote score for a firm based upon how they rate on each uh, category criteria here. Now there is some complexity when you have a firm that may have a very strong score in one category, but a very bad score in another. So theoretically, if you have a firm that treats its employees extremely well and scores good on the social side, but it produces a lot of toxic waste, again, you start getting some, some complexity, what really is this firm and does it really fit in, in a fund or not. But what's important to emphasize is that these scores are not used on their own. They're meant to work in conjunction with traditional financial analysis. So a firm with a really high ESG score, but just terrible profits is going to be marginalized by an ESG fund, just as they would be marginalized by a traditional fund. So in general, however, what do ESG funds look for? Well, they're looking for um, companies that have transparent and accountable governance, good working conditions, good relations to the public, low environmental impact, and low waste. These companies are expected to have strong long-term performance and generally low risks, or that's the general expectation that they have. And I'll pause here to see if there's any questions or feedback. Are there any questions? You can raise your hand or just unmute and ask it. As David I had a question. Um, when it comes to standards that these, that these mutual fund um, managers are using to decide whether something fits a criteria or not, is there any kind of standards that are out there or is it just kind of like kind of one-offs for each individual mutual fund? So I mean, how do they compare against each other, right? How do you know that mutual fund manager A Mutual manager B are, are kind of using the same criteria to make these decisions. Otherwise, you have apples and oranges comparisons. Uh, an excellent question. I do go into detail about this later on, but the preview is um, you don't. That's one of the problems that is faced in the industry. So, where it gets even kind of funnier is that you can have two different funds evaluating the same company and ending up with two very different scores for the same company with the same data. Yeah. Now, um, Usually this is kind of handled, so it depends on also what type of fund you're looking at. If you're talking about an actively managed fund, it really depends upon the fund manager and their particular decisions on how they want to structure their fund. For passively managed funds, usually this is handled at the index level where, um, let's say you're using an MSCI or an S&P index. The ESG version of that index typically has a set uh, screening criteria that is used. So let's say if you had uh, two mutual funds that use the same S&P 500 ESG fund um, as their uh, index, sorry, S&P index as their basis, it should be that those derive very similarly, but you may see something where, you know, investment firm, like let's say Vanguard, you compare Vanguard and iShares, they may try to differentiate each other by addressing some additional rules on top of it. So there's still room for variation. And this is one of the, um, key challenges of the industry as a whole. Um, so that's kind of a preview of some topics we'll discuss in greater detail later on. But no, you're, you're, you're onto a 
major component of uh, the industry itself. <laughs> uh, Kevin, I had a question, uh, yeah. particularly as far as governance. Now, I've been invested in a, in a uh, what I used to call an SRI fund, but I guess now they're all called ESG, or many of them are, uh, since the early 2000s. And at the time, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on environmental and social impacts, uh, but almost none on governance. And I'm wondering if the Sarbanes-Oxley Act from the early 2000s, I think it was 2002 or 2003, if uh, that was a driving factor in these funds incorporating uh, the governance, uh, corporate governance issues. I didn't see a specific mention of Sarbanes-Oxley in the research I had, but I would say that um, the incidents that led to Sarbanes-Oxley uh, were more than likely a big factor. Um, a background, I believe, Sarbanes-Oxley came about after the Enron and WorldCom right. fiascos, as I recall. Yep. Um, the research, they didn't specifically mention, oh, well, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, now we do this. But I think scandals like that were very much in people's minds when they started measuring governance and whether or not um, a corporation has good um, uh, corporate control of itself, basically. Um, the one I, I would say that even if a company is in full compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley, they still might not necessarily score good on governance because um, Sarbanes-Oxley has to do a lot with like accounting practices, which is a good thing. But again, being an accountant myself, um, there's still ways of being in compliance with the law, but kind of presenting things in what you would call creative accounting. So there is that, but above, above that, gov since governance also impacts, are you consulting your stakeholders? Are you letting your shareholders vote on key decisions? Those are things that Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't necessarily control, right. but um, they would go into how a company rates on the governance side. So um, I would say it definitely was, I would say, well, it very likely was in people's minds when they started evaluating governance as a part of how does the company really operate. But I didn't see something that said in black and white, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, we got to do this. So um, I would say it's in the background, but I didn't see a direct mention of it. I have a follow on to that. Uh, I'm just wondering, since we're kind of on this topic about how these funds have changed over the years, uh, and obviously these ESG funds are now exploding. Uh, what do you attribute the explosion in popularity to? Uh, I mean, I can think of lots of different possibilities such as uh, the funds see a little bit of interest and you know, want to make more money. It could be as simple as that. Uh, and I think uh, somewhere you talk about greenwashing and other people have talked about that as far as companies wanting to look good because they're following, uh, following the polls, they're following that interest. Uh, but this whole ESG thing and all the, all the large uh, fund companies and concerns that are investing in that or making these funds available, uh, what, what do you attribute the popularity to? So um, there's a lot of things that could go into it, um, but I think that the white paper that BlackRock just published actually does kind of talk about the four major driving forces that I see that the literal impacts of climate change actually are getting really big. Um, in 2020, I believe there was, um, I wanna say like 22 extreme weather events that caused more than a billion dollars worth of damage. And so this really is scaring um, you, you know, your insurance firms, your banks, et cetera, because the, um, the amount of damage that some companies are subject to is really extreme to the point that they can't just say, hey, yeah, yeah, this is a nice idea, whatever, and all that. I mean, it's very real for certain industries, particularly in certain locations. So there's that. Um, the fact that you also have governments kind of starting to push a lot harder on uh, getting to the net zero uh, carbon emission uh, world, basically. There is also a regulatory push where, you know, certain older industries are gonna be under uh, severe pressure. Uh, Great example is um, just found within cars, actually. It's kind of an interesting thing uh, uh, looking at multiple threads at the same time. California is not gonna allow the sale of gas cars after 2035. And California kind of sets the tone for most of the rest of the country when it comes to these types of emission regula uh, regulations. Um, along with that, you also just have an increased popularity of electric cars just in general because um, electric cars are cool right now and people wanna be, they wanna have them. But what, what electric cars represent? They represent a whole change in industry because um, basically you're not beholden to fossil fuels in order to have your car. You're having to get into this new economy with renewable energies and that sort of thing, or at least that 
typically goes hand in hand with it. Um, so ultimately, I think those four major driving forces of, uh, that were highlighted, I'm just trying to summarize, uh, legitimate damages caused by extreme weather, regulatory pushes, uh, some legitimate changes in energy production leading to renewable energy becoming legitimately cheaper. And finally, just people just legitimately uh, having their taste changed towards ESG in one shape or form. It could be that they legitimately believe in it as a financial strategy or that um, they do have legitimate concerns about the future and want to you know, participate in that. Okay, thank you. But Any there could questions? be a hundred other reasons out there as well. Other questions? <laughs> okay, okay. I, have a que I have a question. Maybe you're gonna hit hit on this, but uh, since you're asking, um, so is it is it market weighted, or I'm sure it varies. But is the is there a tendency to to weight it by market like a normal total stock, you know, index, or how do these other criteria you're talking about affect what how much of a company is represented in a ESG fund, or does it? Um. It definitely varies. So and it, it depends on a couple of different factors that, uh, again, I will be getting into. But the, the short answer is there are funds that try to replicate a total market index just with an ESG you know, screening on top of that. Those typically are market cap weighted or very close to it. Um, there are funds that take a different type of approach where they are using um, ESG screening criteria to more influence the actual weighting of a firm. And so that deviates from market, um, market cap weighting. But where, um, the way that those work is they usually start with a market cap weighting and then use the ESG scores to push certain firms up and down. So it's still got a basis on that, but it does intentionally deviate from it. So um, to really find out that you do kind of have to inspect it uh, the actual fund that you're interested in, because um, there is quite a lot of differences in terms of strategy and utilization of the ESG data, which in part is what makes ESG investing a bit more tricky than it uh, at first appears. But a lot of the common major index, uh, sorry, uh, uh, ESG funds that you're going to find through places like iShares and Vanguard and Fidelity, they usually have these kind of major building block funds that are meant to be a lot simpler and easier to approach for the average person. And those generally try to get closer to market cap weighting. Okay. Any other questions? Back to, back to you then. Okay. Uh, so uh, talk about ESG funds. So uh, let's get into some details on that. So there's many, diff uh, many definitions of what counts as ESG. So, ESG funds are very diverse, with each major rating agency, investment firm, et cetera, making their own decisions on how to interpret ESG data, as well as having very different goals and how they intend to approach the issue of sustainability. Some funds are built around a theme, such as water conservation, carbon transition, or green energy, whereas others are more general and try to replicate a total market index, but you know, just without fossil fuel companies or firms with recent controversies. Interestingly, there are actively managed funds that use ESG data purely for a competitive advantage and really don't care about sustainability. Uh, so within the ESG investment world, there really is a lot of interesting uh, motivations and specializations behind the funds that one can find out there. But what this ultimately adds up to is that comparing ESG funds is not always straightforward. Depending on specific screening criteria, fund strategy, and other factors, two ESG funds may have very different portfolios from one another and therefore very different returns. So when you're looking at funds, one of the first things to evaluate or just to take note of is whether the fund is active or passively managed. Now, most active ESG funds that you find through large investment firms like Vanguard or iShare, they're fairly normal. But if you do go looking for it, there are actively managed ESG funds that can be very much at the frontiers of ESG data, and they may employ some very experimental techniques. This can include such things as very complex risk models that factor in a company's potential losses due to extreme weather to some very exotic techniques, uh, such as analyzing the happiness of a company's employees by literally scanning their social media posts to see if they're complaining about their job. 
And then they actually take this and factor it into their uh, pricing model for the company. Very interesting. Uh, but naturally, these types of exotic techniques are uh, very experimental and they're also very expensive because someone has to spend a lot of time doing this type of research. But that's um, like those, you kind of have to go more to the hedge fund type of space. It's not something like, oh, my, my Vanguard ESG fund is spying on me. Probably not. Uh, for index investors, uh, matters are a bit simpler. As each major rating agency, such as MSCI, Russell, S&P, Bloomberg, Morningstar, et cetera, they usually have ESG versions of their primary indices, such as an ESG version of the S&P 500. Now, most of these index providers usually have multiple ESG indices to accommodate uh, multiple kinds of ESG strategies, usually varying degrees of um, how intense their screening criteria is, usually. Now, an additional layer of complexity with ESG investing is whether the fund is exclusionary by using negative screens or integrated by using positive screens. Now, an exclusionary fund is what most people think of when they think of an ESG fund. The fund will just outright exclude firms that engage in certain kinds of business, such as fossil fuels, weapons, nuclear power, gambling, etc. However, exclusionary funds can vary on what they exclude and how strict they are. Some may have a very narrow focus on what they exclude, whereas others may be very broad and very strict. So again, it helps to, again, dig a little deeper into what it is that you're buying. Now, integrated ESG funds represent a different strategy altogether. These funds, uh, they, they can have several approaches. Some of them may still invest in a total market, uh, in, inside the total market. So they may still include fossil fuels, weapons, et cetera, but they use the ESG scores of each firm to, uh, to decide how much money to invest in a company with companies that have a low ESG score getting substantially reduced money. Another approach that these same funds may have, and again, it depends on their specific strategy, is that they may pick out firms that have a low ESG score, but that they're actively trying to improve. And so they may still invest in these firms in order to kind of motivate them towards uh, you know, further improvement, getting to a more sustainable business strategies. Um, this highlights one of the major debates within the ESG industry itself, and that is whether it's better to just divest from certain industries altogether, or whether it's better to stay invested and to try to use your ownership votes to push for change. And presently, there's no answer on this. It's just something that's being philosophically debated within the industry. Uh, there's quite a bit of information there. Any questions? Any questions, you can use the uh, raise hand or just unmute and ask your question. Which ones typically have better returns? What was that? Which ones typically have better returns, exclusionary or integrated? Uh, you know, that actually is a really interesting question. Um, I would say, uh, I've got uh, like several slides. Kevin, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, really good question. Um, I'd say that at, as of right now, I don't know if there's really been a pattern that exclusionary is better than integrated. Um, I do have quite a bit of slides coming up about profitability and just some of the ins and outs of that because that's um, ultimately the question that we all wanna know, but it's also complicated. <laughs> okay, I've got a whole lot of questions till the end because you probably have, you're gonna discuss all this stuff ahead of <laughs> No, but I mean, ultimately that's, you know, it's. What are we here for? It's in, right. you know, making money. Okay. <laughs> uh, anything else before we carry on? Okay. So um, ESG fund managers, they don't just make investment decisions based upon what companies the green is. To the contrary, ESG fund managers are attempting to use their data, such as greenhouse gas emissions, water use, employee turnover, accounting practices, et cetera, to find advantageous investing opportunities over and beyond what traditional financial analysis would reveal. The way that the ESG industry itself would explain it, they're attempting to use non-financial data to help explain and give greater context to financial data. So in a sense, ESG fund managers are trying to get a more complete 360 degree image of a firm's financial performance by better understanding how the firm uses non-financial capital, such as human capital, and intellectual capital to make their profits. So one example in one of the presentations I saw was 
um, on statement of cash flows, which is a typical financial measure, and how that might be impacted by social data, as an example. Um, so potentially understanding such things about a company as their employee tenure, their employee engagement, turnover, and other such factors might help to explain the company's cash flows and give an indication of whether the cash flows are sustainable. And for good reason, high turnover means that the firm can't keep talented people, which suggests that they have poor management and that may pose a risk to the, fund's long -term, uh, the firm's long-term profits. Whereas a firm that can keep talented employees likely has good, uh, a good work environment as well as good management, and that suggests the potential for stronger long-term profitability. Now, obviously, other factors are at play, and it's not just limited to just those little data points, but what this really is is that these types of insights allow analysts to dig just that much deeper into a company's performance to better understand whether a firm really is a good investment. And uh, beyond giving insights into investment opportunities, where ESG data has been very useful is in detecting risk, specifically risk that traditional financial measures would miss. Now, this could include such things as whether a firm is at risk of having its assets destroyed by extreme weather or at the risk of what's called stranded assets, which are assets that get banned by government regulation. So for example, in uh, the white paper that BlackRock published this week, um, they stated that if the world's governments got serious about restricting carbon emitting assets, the oil and gas industry alone could have upwards of 900 billion in assets being banned from use, which is a third of the value of the entire industry. Now, this type of data is being factored into analyst projections on future profitability for the firms of all industries and rightfully so. Any industry at risk of losing one third of its assets for any reason, has a very substantial risk to face. But that being said, ESG data is still rapidly evolving and the ESG industry is still very early in understanding how to use its data to consistently find outperforming investments. Where analysts have had some success is in identifying risks through the use of ESG data, but what they've not been able to do is that they've not been able to consistently find excess returns through the use of ESG data. So they can find uh, risks that may not be at uh, otherwise identified, but they've not been able to consistently year after year find alpha, basically, um, ex excess profits above the market. But even so, the industry is really, really confident that it eventually will find ways of utilizing ESG data to find alpha, especially, especially as ESG data reporting becomes more common and analysts have more data to draw from. However, even proponents from within the industry itself remark that ESG analysis may never reach a full state of standardization or uniformity, and that there's always going to be subjectivity to ESG, and that there's never going to be a full consensus on uh, basically just anything in regards to ESG. Uh, quite a bit of interesting statements there. Is anything, any questions from anyone? Again, you can unmute to ask a question. Hi, this you guys is the last bullet point. Hi, this is Phil. I was going to ask you about your one word that you use, subjectivity, and yeah. that's really concerning when I hear that. Uh, what can you go into that a little bit and what that might mean in turn as an investor? Absolutely. In fact, actually, that's kind of what the next slide oh, deals okay. with pretty much entirely. So um, it's actually just a good. Um, there, there's quite a bit going on with that. So. Um, let me get to the next slide, and then if you that may still prompt additional questions from you, and rightfully so. And so, um, we can go through it when I complete the next slide. If that sounds good to you. Okay, so some challenges with ESG data. So, as I said, ESG data will always be subjective because there's multiple levels of inconsistency. Now, the first layer being that each rating agency, investment firm, etc., has different screening criteria. So, two different funds may very well have two different ESG scores for the same company. The next layer of complexity, and it's the single biggest challenge facing the ESG industry itself, is the collection of ESG data. ESG data in its current state is largely gathered on a self-reported basis as there is no formal requirement for disclosing ESG data, no formal requirement that determines what data to disclose, and no standards on uh, how to report ESG data, et cetera. In other words, there's no formal requirement saying what you have to report, how you have to report it, and when you have to report it. It's purely on a self-reported basis, in most places, that is. 
this makes it difficult to compare companies because they may report completely different types of data. And even if they do report the same thing, let's say greenhouse gas emissions, they may format it very differently to the point that it makes it difficult for ESG analysts to actually get a true apples to apples comparison, at least in the current state of affairs. Um, so in other words, uh, ESG analysis is complicated. However, this is changing. Just this year, the European Union, Union has mandated that publicly traded European firms must disclose ESG data, though there is still some work going on of handling exactly what types of data, the exact format of it, et cetera. Um, that is something that they're still working on. The EU is also exploring the option of private firms, not even the publicly traded firms, also may have to disclose ESG statistics. Now, this is a significant move as it will help to standardize quite a lot of ESG data and clearly ESG data from the EU itself. And it will also allow for much clearer comparisons between firms and between industries. Additionally, it is hoped that this move uh, from the EU will help force other regions of the world to make similar ESG disclosure requirements mandatory because at, um, at the moment, you do have some, uh, you do have some groups like um, IFRS, the International um, uh, Accounting Standards Setting Group, trying to push for more ESG disclosures. You also have large investors also demanding disclosures of ESG, but it's not really until you have laws put in place that say you must do it, where it's gonna consistently happen. Now, the next biggest concern in the ESG industry is whether firms are disclosing distorted numbers or only the numbers that are favorable to them in a process called greenwashing. For example, while many companies are reporting on their greenhouse gas emissions, there's very few firms, uh, firms that are reporting on the rates of employee turnover because apparently those numbers aren't quite so nice and they don't want to share it. Now, due to the concerns of greenwashing, ESG funds do spend a lot of effort to try to cross-reference a firm's uh, disclosed data to determine whether the data is legitimate or not. Now, again, they're not doing this because they want to say, oh, well, how green are you? They're doing it because they wanna make sure that the financial analysis that they're making is valid. Now, what forms can this take? This can take uh, the form of questioning the firm's management or the board of directors and investor calls. It can be reviewing meeting minutes. It can be uh, reviewing climate plans, reviewing third-party analyst reports, et cetera. It's very labor intensive and expensive research. And in this current state, it's not perfect. Despite all the scrutiny though, um, there's a lot of companies that are willing to publish ESG data because ESG funds are increasingly attracting more and more capital. And some companies realize that they wanna get serious about disclosing the data so that they can tap into the capital that is in ESG uh, funds. So uh, that concludes that slide. So Phil, uh, additional questions you may have about uh, subjectivity. Oh, I I don't necessarily have another question, I, but from your four points on here, it's just really concerning about how sub subjective it can be. And like you said, we're here to make money. So um, I think caution is warranted. So. I have a follow-up question, uh, Kevin. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you talk about the European Union here, their, their mandate. Um, I haven't heard of any similar mandate, perhaps you have, in the United States. Uh, any, any comments about uh, any mandates that might be coming within the US? Uh, the hope is that there would be in the near future, but at the moment I've not heard anything about it. Um, but granted, outside of the European Union, I don't think anybody else really has anything on the table as far as something they're gonna do in the immediate future. Um, I believe that there is gonna be a, um, a uh, summit of the, uh, there's a summit in Glasgow coming up within a week or so between the major nations of the world specifically to discuss climate related issues. And maybe someone's gonna pull out a surprise announcement from there, but as of right now, uh, no, this isn't really on the radar within America, um, but it's not completely on the radar for other nations of the world as well. So it's not, it's not just us. So you don't see the SEC or even FINRA being involved as far as uh, as far as regulation of ESG funds? I think increasingly there is a push for it. It's just a matter of whether or not you're going to get like formal regulation on it. Um, the hope would be that we would have something in the next couple of years, but um, at the moment I've not heard anything. Not to say that there's not anything going on, just that I've not heard about it, but. Um, if we actually did get a legitimate push towards 
every American company having to disclose this data. And that actually brings us a lot closer to actually having reliable analysis on how valid are people's ESG data. Because if you had it coming from everybody, then statisticians, quant uh, managers, et cetera, would be able to troll through it and actually see what's going on. So currently, uh, at least for the United States and possibly other uh, world funds as well, it's uh, self-regulated, self-standardized. In other words, uh, you mentioned in an earlier slide that uh, each fund has their own, or each index, perhaps, if there's an ESG index, index uh, they would have their own standards for what ESG is and some reporting requirements that they self-apply. Uh, so I assume that some of the bigger players like BlackRock or Vanguard um, could kind of be a force unto themselves as far as uh, mandating some information. I'm not sure it'd be environmental. Vanguard seems to be more interested in corporate governance than they are environmental. Yeah. Um, incidentally, and, and there, there's actually some interesting discussion on this that I, my research, um, there were, uh, there's not entirely a willingness from most governments to really mandate this sort of thing. And they're kind of pushing the responsibility into the finance sector to kind of regulate where they don't necessarily want to. And the financial sector kind of pushes back and saying, look, we don't write the laws of the land. We represent how to make money given this current state of affairs in the land, but we're not here to really draw a hard line. Uh, you do get large investors um, like uh, pension funds, that sort of thing, demanding more clear definitions of ESG data because they really do want to know because an, um, a pension fund has an extremely long-term view of things um, because they're having to provide retirement funds for large amounts of workers. Um, but yeah, currently you, you are getting some pushes from, I would say, smaller players, um, BlackRock and Vanguard being smaller than the government, obviously. Um, and, the, and those are still valid pushes. Um, in terms of who's really taken it the most seriously, um, admittedly, BlackRock has been making a big public show about their support of ESG. And, uh, you know, frankly, um, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of it. I don't really own too much of BlackRock's products. I just have a, like one or two small funds that I have in a tilting strategy or whatever, but I'll applaud them for really taking steps towards being serious about this. They actually have really big disclosures of every single fund they have, what industries are involved and whether they're tied up with things like um, greenhouse gas emissions, nuclear power, weapons productions, et cetera. And, and it's not just the ESG funds. They state these statistics for every single product they have. It's commendable. Thank you. So um, natural question is, uh, does this make a difference? <laughs> um, one of the, I think, primary questions about ESG investing. So we've talked a lot about how complex ESG investing can be. And so the natural question is, well, is it, is, is it worth it? Does your money make the world a better place through an ESG product? Uh, after all, you're just investing money. You're not out there, you know, planting trees or feeding the homeless. And so, you know, what, what's really going on? Well, again, ESG funds, all they're doing is they're buying shares of companies and short of an IPO, buying the shares of a firm doesn't directly impact the firm itself, yet ESG funds concentrate capital into firms that happen to have good ESG scores. So does that make the world a better place? And I would say with a number of caveats, it can, uh, but it's indirect at best. It's not something where, oh, I put $1,000 into an ESG fund and now uh, the world's safe. You can't invest your way to a better world, unfortunately. But what actually does happen? So the biggest positive outcome you get from investing in an ESG fund is that it impacts the access to capital that companies have. So companies whose stock price is very large and highly traded can negotiate for superior terms on loans to fund new projects, expansion efforts, et cetera, whereas companies with low stock prices or stock prices that aren't heavily traded will not be able to get such favorable terms on loans. Thus, all else being equal, firms with a high ESG score should attract investment from uh, these ESG funds, which again are attracting more and more, uh, a larger uh, percentage of the capital being invested, and therefore they should be able to get, again, uh, better terms on loans and be able to expand more aggressively, et cetera. And so incrementally, it should be that the market will favor terms with a high ESG score and allow them to grow more, uh, you know, more aggressively than a company with a low ESG score. 
But again, this is really indirect at best. And it should be noted that again, investing alone isn't, you know, it's, it's not everything. That alone is not gonna save the world. So if you're extremely eco-conscious uh, eco or socially conscious, you do need to look for other, you know, activities in order to, um, you know, push for change in whatever form that may take, personal advocacy, or, uh, et cetera. But still keeping within the investment world, are there other options that may have a positive impact on the world? And the answer actually is yes. Uh, there is uh, green bonds, which are much more direct and legitimately having an impact upon the world. So whereas your typical ESG fund just trades stocks back and forth in the secondary market, Green bonds actually direct finance, um, they directly finance green projects such as building wind or solar infrastructure, clean water infrastructure, et cetera. So in terms of investment return though, they, are, uh, they have the exact same returns as any other bond from a particular issuer. So if you're buying a green bond from a company, it's gonna have the same terms as a corporate bond of the same duration. If you buy a green bond from a municipality, a city, it's gonna have the um, same terms as a muni bond. And like a muni bond, um, certain, uh, certain green bonds will come with certain tax advantages. So there's a little bit of additional incentive there, but that depends on who's issuing the green bonds specifically. Um, most firms or governments that do issue green bonds, they usually try to get a third, a third party to evaluate and certify the bond issuance to signal to investors that they're raising money for a qualifying green project and that it's not just, again, some greenwashing cash grab type thing. Um, so investors know that the purpose is legitimate. Um, and this is a part of the ESG world that's really growing rapidly. And it's something that a lot of uh, governments, pension funds, et cetera, are really looking into and putting a lot of money into. Um, and it does have a much more direct impact on the world. Again, you're actually helping to finance the construction of solar, wind, or whatever else. The only thing is, is that from a personal investment side, it's got the same returns as any other bond from that particular issues, issuer. So, um, it may help to complement your bond allocation, but uh, you know, I wouldn't think that green bonds alone would make you a billionaire, but still, if you're very conscious of, you wanna make sure your money is making a legitimate difference, it's something to think about. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah, um, I've heard of green bonds once before. Is it, a bit, are there any funds that specialize in that, that, would, that, yeah. you, that are reputable? Yeah. Um, I would say, um, so Vanguard has a corporate bond ESG fund. Um, iShares also has specifically a green bond uh, fund that they have. They also have a couple of other ESG bond funds available uh, that come in different intensities of screening. Um, but what I've seen with most of the green bond funds is that they're very similar to a corporate bond fund. So in terms of, if you're, if you're looking at this again, pragmatically, how do I balance my portfolio? How do I get good returns? I would, you want to think of them very much like corporate bonds and whether or not they fit within your portfolio. Uh, Kevin, are most of these uh, green bonds that you described, you mentioned that Vanguard has a fund of bonds, uh, these corporate bonds. Uh, are these, uh, they wouldn't be considered high yield, are they? Uh, it varies from fund to fund. They do have high yield green bonds, but they also have more investment grade ones as well. So, so knowing Vanguard, they probably have one that's a uh, pretty good credit risk. I forget the exact credit risk of the Vanguard one, but I wouldn't think that they would be hanging out in the triple Bs. But um, well, they may have a slice of it. I wouldn't think that 40% of the uh, fund itself is in that. <laughs> okay, thanks. I wouldn't think so. At least. But you know, uh, after the presentation, we, we can look at that. Not, that's a good question. <laughs> Bill? Hi. Um, I was going to ask about the yield on the green bonds and if you've run across, uh, if there's any premium or discount or something with the green bonds, because I think as you, you're in retirement, you might want to consider this or going toward retirement. So might be interesting for a portion. Uh, so the yield the on green bond. The yield. Sorry, what was that? The question's about the yield. Right. So yield should match any other bond issued by the same organization, at least in its current state of affairs. There's some talk that maybe 
maybe governments can incentivize green bonds by giving a more of a tax credit or some other sort of benefit to it. But in the current state of affairs, it's just like any other bond from the same issuer. Um, particularly if you're able to find green muni bonds, then it's just like owning muni bonds in general, which can have a tax advantage, which in certain scenarios may be very attractive to you because then you get the tax credit and you just feel good that your money's going towards something positive. Um, but otherwise, um, the bond is going to behave exactly like any other bond from the particular issuer. So I think like Coca-Cola had like uh, a really big green bond issuance in the past year or so. And it's going to be just like any other bond from Coca-Cola with a similar duration, which uh, most of these green bonds, they usually have a very long duration. So they're usually um, uh, uh, very long for the company to pay it back. Is there any other questions? Nope. Okay. So the other big question, do ESG funds perform well? And we've actually got several slides talking about this. So um, this is an issue that's really hotly debated between the ESG industry, academia, and pretty much the rest of the financial world. There's a general consensus among academic papers that ESG funds are expected to return less than a total market fund. But uh, depending on the research paper, the difference can vary. Some research claims that the difference in expected returns is pretty small, such as returning about a half a percent less or so than a total market index. But there's other research out there that suggests that maybe the difference is pretty big, like two and a half percent, which uh, is very big. Um, it, there's a number of reasons why the research thinks that there is a difference between ESG funds and total market, but the, uh, the simplest reasons are that your typical ESG fund divests from certain industries. So the companies that they cut off, you miss out on their, their particular returns. And also that there's an increase in risk because you have less diversification. If you cut off 200 companies, you just have 200 less companies to spread your risk around, basically. However, the actual returns on ESG funds that are based upon the major indices, such as those that are designed to track the MSCI, the S&P, the Bloom, uh, Bloomberg, et cetera, have actually tracked really closely to their parent index. And over a 15 year period, the difference was extremely small. And in more recent years, uh, the ESG index actually has outperformed the parent index, interestingly. Uh, and we'll go, I do have some future slides that depict this graphically, so you don't have to just take it at my word. Um, but to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the academic papers are wrong. The research is valid and it's very well researched. I think that there's a couple of issues at play. And again, I've emphasized it's that I think that there's a couple of issues at play. I'm just some guy talking to you. I'm not a scientist or anything, but, but my personal opinion on what accounts for the difference are as follows. First, fossil fuel companies, weapons manufacturers, alcohol gambling companies, et cetera, those usually compose a fairly small percentage of uh, your average total market fund. And so an ESG version of a total market fund that excludes those industries and replaces them with more tech stocks, which have been the dominant factor over the past 15 years anyway, probably has actually performed pretty well. Second, ESG funds come in a wide variety of different strategies. And so it's natural that some are gonna perform better than others. An ESG fund that's designed to track closely to your total market index should be expected to be pretty close in performance. Whereas really unique strategies uh, such as uh, some of the active management ESG funds that are out there, well, those can obviously deviate. And sometimes they could deviate pretty substantially both to the positive and to the negative. Third, performing back tests on ESG funds can actually be pretty complex because a single fund's holdings actually change, or at least they can change from year to year due to changing ESG scores for each firm that they invest in. There's some years where they may include a particular company and then the next year they may Take them off because maybe there was a recent controversy with that company that violated the terms of the fund, for example. Um, for th the past two to three years have generally been more favorable to ESG funds just in general, um, particularly because of the dominance of tech stocks, which are usually kind of like the dominant force inside most ESG funds in general. So the past couple of years have also just been very favorable towards ESG just in general. Now, fourth, um, Common consensus among the academic papers, at least the ones that I uh, look through, and there's plenty more, um, have commonly suggested that companies with really high ESG scores generally perform worse than companies with low ESG scores. 
But the ESG industry itself is challenging that. And with some of the recent performance among companies like you know, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, companies that are usually included in ESG funds, um, there, there is some basis for challenging that assertion. So the, uh, to go into detail, the ESG industry believes that companies with high ESG scores uh, make for really good long-term investment opportunities due to a combination of characteristics that they generally have. Um, high ESG companies are generally lower risk than a traditional business by being transparent in their business practices, inclusive of many stakeholders in decision making, having fair employment practices, and generally having a long term approach to business. Now, this culminates in a variety of benefits, including being less likely to face litigation, fines, or penalties because they're including more stakeholders in decision making, and they're less likely to piss people off, basically. And the transparency makes it easier for them to apply for loans to in order to fund uh, their expansion efforts. High ESG firms also generally focus on reducing material waste and on conserving resources. And this often comes from the firms making large investments into automation, quality management, employee training, and other efforts that generally make the firm efficient with its money and its resources. So for an example, Procter & Gamble began a zero manufacturing waste to landfill program in 2008 and by 2018, they have succeeded in diverting 80% of operational waste from going to a landfill. And they hope to divert all waste by the end of this year, 2021. Now, most of the success that they've had comes in the form of really, really clever product recycling efforts that they've developed over the course of that decade. High ESG firms often engage in research and development as part of a long-term business plan. And while research efforts may take a long time to pay off, they can lead to a competitive advantage. For example, Microsoft's investments into cloud computing and gaming have allowed Microsoft to become a major player in both markets. Despite the fact that Microsoft did not start as the dominant player in either one. And it took years of consistent investment, research and development for Microsoft to get to the position that it is now in both, uh, both uh, markets, cloud and uh, gaming. Additionally, firms with high ESG scores tend to attract better workers and keep them for longer than firms with low ESG scores. Uh, and this is uh, for a number of reasons. Most employees don't like the idea of working for a company that is viewed poorly by the general public because they don't want, uh, you know, they don't want their work life to be you know, looked upon poorly uh, because their workplace has a bad reputation. But also part of what makes a high ESG firm get its high score in the first place is because they have uh, they have and better employment practices and work culture, so they're often just better places to work. Classic example being, um, well, I say, current example being Cisco Systems, which Fortune Magazine just rated as 2021's best place to work, and Cisco is a part of most ESG uh, funds. Taken as a whole, and given some recent successes from companies like Microsoft, Google, Tesla, etc., it suggests that high ESG firms do make sense as long-term holding. Now, again, this is primarily the arguments that the ESG industry itself makes. So you have them trying to build a claim towards their own funds, but I think there is some legitimacy to it. To help illustrate some of the points about ESG performance, um, actually, let me stop there before I introduce the next round of slides. So anything that's been discussed, is there any questions? We can save some of these questions for later, Kevin. Okay. So um, to illustrate some of the points about ESG performance, I found some slides from a presentation given by Professor Mark Zurich of Columbia Business School that illustrates his research into ESG fund performance, and I decided to steal his slides for you guys. So um, this first slide shows a risk and return curve for a statistical sampling of traditional total market portfolios and ESG portfolios. The darker line represents, uh, so. Yeah, so the, the darker line represents traditional funds, whereas the green line represents ESG portfolios. While this graph does uphold that ESG portfolios generally have lower expected returns and a little bit of increased risk, the difference in the curves is fairly small. The expected return drops by approximately a half of a percent, uh, at least depending on exactly where you're at in the curve. And there's also a similarly small uh, increase in risk. The main point he was trying to make was that it, given his research, it's closer than some other research is made the claim. Um, just as interestingly, this slide tracks the median returns of traditional mutual funds in the dark blue line versus ESG mutual funds, uh, and I should say it's a statistical sampling of them, uh, ESG mutual funds in the green line. There's also the blue line at the bottom that shows the difference between the two, but the main point of the chart is that over the course of 15 years, 
the median returns between traditional funds and ESG funds has actually been pretty close. For quite a lot of the chart, it looks like it's just a single line, but you will see certain cases where they reach out apart from each other. And, um, and again, if anyone wants to go back to these, because it's a lot of information to come in, we can do that. Um, this chart provides a really nice and simple comparison of the five major indices, or at least five major indices, and the related ESG variations and the return over uh, periods of time. In most cases, the ESG variations of each index have performed very closely to the parent index, and generally the gap um, shrinks as time goes on. However, in instances where there are multiple ESG variations, such as MSCI and Morningstar, uh, there are some funds that have performed better than others, and this just comes down to differences between the fund screening criteria, the strategies, etc. Some funds are stricter than others, and that can lead to more variation from the parent index. So quite a lot of pilfered information. If uh, there's any questions on any of the charts presented, we can talk about those. I have a question, but uh, I'll save it. Okay. So uh, to summarize, academic research to date has suggested that ESG funds do have lower expected returns and higher risk compared to the total market fund because ESG funds are less diversified. However, the actual returns of ESG funds based off of the major stock indices such as MSCI and S&P have actually very closely mirrored the parent index. So based upon that, my own personal opinion is that if your tastes do align with ESG investing, you're not going to be selling out your financial future by investing in an ESG fund. However, one thing I do hope is that I've conveyed some of the complexities of ESG investing and that you know, ESG funds are not created equal. They, they can vary quite a lot. So I would stress that if this is something that you're interested in, that again, just do your due diligence and research each fund. Try to get an idea of what a strategy is before uh, investing. And any questions before moving on? Uh, it's more of a comment. Thank you, Kevin. This is really good background. It's really very interesting. I didn't know as much about it as you're telling us. I'm sure a lot of other people are having that reaction. Uh, to me, I, I'm just thinking about some people in my life who um, clearly to them money, hmm, like they really want to do good with their money and they feel like I was just talking to a friend the other day who uh, I don't actually think the ESG funds are en were enough for him. He said he started Vanguard, but then he was thinking about going out or something because to him, he wanted to do good with his money. And I have some family who, who is kind of, I believe feels that way. And in fact, that's why I bought for my niece when I started a custodial IRA for her, um, I bought her the Vanguard ESG fund because I thought it would resonate for her family more. And I think it does because of this, the value system is different. So it's just a comment, you know, to me, I, I, I do see it a little more, I see it differently. And I, and I appreciate the, what you're bringing to me. And it just seems to me that some people really have a strong, a different mindset about what they want their money to do, or at least how they want to feel about where they put their money seems to be a big factor. So just wanted to add that. Oh, I really appreciate that, Chris. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the audience before we move on? One uh, Kevin, we have about a half hour left, so you might want to finish the presentation and then open it up. All right. Elizabeth? I'll wait. OK. okay. Or actually close to the end. So um, what are some other uh, criticisms of ESG? So um, there's a number of things that come up with ESG and I'll, I'll present at least a selection of some common things that I've noticed. Obviously there's uh, clearly could be more, but just to, just, to, um, just to provide some thoughts on it. So if ESG data is you know as inconsistent as I'm portraying, can you take it seriously? And I would say the, in, the ESG industry itself freely admits that ESG data, the standards, the analytical models, et cetera, they're all in a state of rapid evolution uh, as the industry itself is getting onto firmer footing in how to use ESG data. And there's a lot of research and experimentation from within the industry to, again, try to come to a consensus on how best to utilize that 
Also coming up again, if there are increasing pushes from uh, regulators to standardize the disclosures or to mandate the disclosure of ESG, then that also is going to do a lot to uh, improve the quality of ESG data analysis. However, it should be uh, mentioned that ESG funds do not rely solely on ESG data to make investment decisions. They still use your traditional financial measures and techniques. So it's not just saying, oh, well, the company's green, but it's losing millions of dollars. Let's go for them. That doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, they want to make sure that the returns are as strong as possible, but within certain boundaries. So it's not just statisticians wild west or something like that. Uh, so uh, another criticism is, well, can't you just kind of like reverse engineer an ESG fund by getting, you know, a tech ETF, a finance ETF, a healthcare ETF, et cetera. And yes, you can do, you can build a low carbon portfolio this way, but if you do get a total market ESG fund, that will still give you exposure to most market sectors out there in a, in a singular fund. Um, and depending on exactly the strategy, if you get one of the more um, the, more of a positive screening fund, it may help to select um, funds that uh, firms, I should say, companies that have a low ESG score but are making hard commitments to improving themselves. And so that can be a, another means of you know this opportunity out there. Um, another comment that I because um, this was a question that was asked in one of the um, presentations I saw is that the other thing about the industry itself. Um, to emphasize is that if you just get a couple of ETFs, it may not be building towards a uh, net zero carbon future. So if that is something that you care about, then that's still a reason to consider an ESG fund. Uh, next complaint, uh, well, they're too expensive. So ESG funds generally are more expensive than a total market fund because there is additional research involved. However, there's options out there uh, for ESG, uh, particularly on the passive side, for ESG funds that are under 10 basis points. Uh, I think one of the cheapest ones I saw was, I wanna say like eight basis points, but um, there might be one that's even cheaper. Uh, quite a lot of the passive ESG funds that I have seen are usually between 10 and 20 bit, uh, basis points, which I'd say is low enough to be comfortable for most Bogle heads, but obviously traditional total market indices are uh, a bit cheaper. Uh, next is, uh, you know, is it a scam? I mean, is this just uh, the finance world kind of preying upon people's, uh, you know, desires for environmentalism or, you know, what's going on with this? And I would say that ESG investing has a lot of challenges, including firms greenwashing their data and some ESG funds having looser strategies towards sustainability. What I would argue is that ESG investing as a whole isn't necessarily a scam, just that there's limits to what you can do through investing. If you're truly eco-conscious, then you can't just invest your way to a better world. You do have to think of other forms of advocacy and you know, just being an active participant and trying to get the green future that I think uh, quite a lot of people do want. And there's still um, things like the green bonds and all that, which as I said, that's a much more direct means of trying to finance green projects, et cetera. So um, there are avenues like that, but just in general, um, at least to date, you can't just buy a better world, unfortunately. Or at least we can't. I mean, maybe someone else can, but I can't. <laughs> um, last, what about uh, you know your cynics who only care about money? Just you know, uh, nothing else matters. Just money, money, money. Uh, should they consider an ESG fund? And again, you know, there's no real solid argument to say that they have to do it. But what I would say is there's still reasons to think about it, and um, it, mainly because there are trends in industry right now that are leaning towards things that are going to favor ESG funds anyway. So let's just take a really simple example. Um, 20 years from now, do you think that there's gonna be more electric cars in the road or less? Well, probably more. Now, if there's gonna be more electric cars in the road, do you think that people are probably gonna want more solar panels so that they can you know, charge their cars at home? Uh, so, you know, it's probably likely that there would be. Well, if electric cars are going up and if social, uh, solar panels are going up, what do you think is gonna to happen to the aggregate demand for oil, gas, coal, et cetera? Well, naturally, it would probably decrease. Um, if any of you are fans of Kathy Wood from ARK Invest, she actually was positing that changes towards um, renewable energy and electric vehicles and that sort of thing may have substantial permanent decreases in the value of oil. She actually posited that oil may get as 
down as low as uh, $10 a barrel because of the uh, potential um, deflationary impacts of these new technologies. And if you think that that's a rational argument, then I would say even from a very cynical position, there's reasons to consider it. And I just say to consider, I'm not saying you have to go and do it, but just that there's, there's forces on right now that are intriguing that will influence ESG returns. And I know, again, just going through the rest of the presentation, we'll have our Q&A session. So let's say, hey, you know, you're interested in ESG funds and you kind of want to take a look around at them. So a few notes about that. As I've talked about, ESG funds are very diverse and they can be found through most investment firms. Uh, there's different ESG indices with different criteria, different fund goals and strategies, and there's a changing landscape of ESG data for fund managers to use to make their investment decisions. The variety of ESG funds available to pick from is also growing, and so you should be able to find something that'll suit your own personal preferences. But, oh, okay, I am here. First and foremost, it should be stated that the usual boglehead principles of fund selection still apply. The fund has to fit your asset allocation strategy. The fund has to have low fees, and you need to be able to get as much diversification as you can within the boundaries of your own personal ESG preferences. Um, commonly, ETFs are something that the industry is going towards. A lot of the new ESG funds that have been coming about in the last year have been in ETF form, but there are mutual fund options as well that are out there. Now, beyond the Boglehead guidelines, selecting an ESG fund is not always simple, and I think I've illustrated that. You need to make sure that the goals of the fund align with your own goals. ESG funds can vary a lot in what they include or exclude and whether your and whatever your preferences are, you don't want to buy into a fund that's counter to your own beliefs and tastes. So, for example, some funds may buy into fossil fuel companies that happen to have a higher than average ESG score. And depending on your own personal taste, you know, that may, may or may not fit with your personal desires. So I would say just read carefully what it is that the ESG fund strategy is before buying into it, because again, there's a wide world of variation amongst them. Now, in terms of real, uh, just really, okay, where do I go and find some ESG funds? Um, here's just a really quick selection of some ESG funds from some of the major investment firms. So starting off with Vanguard, they offer uh, currently five ESG funds for retail investors. And these are primarily your sort of major building block type of um, portfolios. And again, if you get the slides, you can click the links and get to the individual uh, funds themselves. Um, the three that I'm showing here are, again, some building block funds, such as um, an ESG version of their total market, uh, U.S. total market international and corporate bond fund. Uh, BlackRock's iShares currently offers about 30 ESG funds, which represents a variety of different strategies. They offer ETFs that cover domestic, international, emerging market, and bond funds in several different lay of, uh, levels of ESG screening intensity. And they also offer some specialist funds, which include such things as themed ETFs, which are kind of a popular thing right now. These include themes such as carbon transition, green bond funds, and other sort of specialist strategies. Fidelity offers a good selection of about 11 ESG funds, which also represents, again, ESG versions of their flagship total market funds, as well as some interesting themed options, such as they have a, a fund based around water conservation, renewable energies, and climate action. And coming in last, is Schwab, who currently has no Schwab-branded ESG funds. Instead, they just link their customers to a big old list of funds from other companies. Um, I, I imagine they're probably going to get on the bandwagon before long, but as of right now, yeah, they, they just say, hey, here's a list and figure it out. Uh, so, <laughs> um, in conclusion, ESG investing is becoming increasingly mainstream, and it's uh, pulling in exponential amounts of funds through a combination of increasing climate risk, regulatory risk, investor preferences, and an ongoing evolution in ESG data analytics. As ESG data proliferates and standardizes, even traditional investment funds are going to have to take positions based upon ESG data to help manage risk and optimize returns. Now, as this happens, experts within the field, such as that professor who I stole those slides from, believe that ESG is going to ultimately become a normal part of financial analysis and that ultimately all forms of investing will take ESG into consideration. 20 years from now, all funds may be ESG funds in some shape or form. 
And as this happens, the hope is that investors will be able to invest with confidence that their money is making uh, a positive impact on the world, while also ensuring that they get a share of that positive. And that's the presentation for today. Last tab is, uh, last slide is a big list of um, sources that you can go through and there's more sources in the notes. So if you wanna double check anything that I presented, you definitely can. Great, Kevin, thank you so much. That was great.